Okay, we are going to begin lesson eight, uh, criticism on trial. And what we want to try to accomplish this evening is to look at the four basic um, elements for the proper practice of criticism. There are four pillars that I have developed that will help us exercise the proper practice of criticism. Now, most of the time over these seven sessions, we have viewed criticism from a negative point of view. Criticism does have a positive side to it. The positive side is to speak the truth to someone and or to ourselves for the purpose of addressing an area of life for change. And that's a positive thing. That is something that should be taking place in the Christian's life. So the first mark is truthfulness. Truthfulness. A critical person believes they are speaking the truth and they believe they are doing so in love and for the welfare of the hearer. But the evidence of the expression of quote unquote truthfulness is injurious to the hearer. This truthfulness assaults the hearer's character, leaving them wounded. The byways and the highways of Christianity are littered with the wounded saint who has suffered friendly fire. Now, the critic's truthfulness is diluted. Like murky lake water that clouds the lake's bottom, truthfulness is diluted. It becomes diluted by the critic's emotional response to personal expectations that the hearer did not achieve. Now, these emotions of anger, bitterness, and animosity and resentment ooze out in slander, malice, gossip, backbiting, and lying. The end result is division, decay, and destroyed relationships. The critics' feelings distort the facts surrounding the incident in question. When the critic's feelings master the heart, mind, soul, and strength, it can be likened to two magnets set on opposite poles. The result is one of repelling the other. But when God's truth rules the heart, mind, soul, and strength in the critic and the hearer, then those magnets are set on like poles and are drawn to each other. God's truth draws, the critic's truth repels. Truthfulness must never be used as a tool of evaluation. Only truth must be used. The truth is found in the Word of God. The critic's expectations and the hearer's conduct are measured against the plumb line of God's Word. God's word evaluates and judges. This is necessary truth because God's word brings conviction while providing hope for change and the means to change. A critic's plumb line is judgmental, decimating the hearer and adds to the critic's expectations for the hearer's changing. The hearer, however, does not know what needs to be changed if, quote unquote, whatever should be changed and how it should be changed. So what we are dealing with here for the first mark, which is truth, is the difference between truthfulness and truth. So let me go to the next slide and try to illustrate this for us, okay? All right, on the 
left side of your screen, you have two people. And on the right side of the screen, you have two people, one with a question mark. So the person up on the top is being criticized for something that they are not doing or should be doing. And it's an unbiblical expectation by the person down on the bottom here. Their criticism is communicating an unbiblical expectation. The reason it's unbiblical is because it is their personal expectation of how the person should respond, act, feel, or do. What needs to take place is the person that is being criticized should go to the Word of God. The Word of God presents truth. The man on the bottom is presenting truthfulness from his tainted perspective. That's why it's an unbiblical expectation. So the person who's being criticized needs to go to the Word of God and find out the truth of what might be taking place. From there, expectations can be clarified. And this is important. Notice that it's the Word of God that provides the clarification of whatever is the conduct of the person should be living. This is central. And I hope every believer understands the value and the validity and the certainty of the Word of God for daily living. Peter tells us that we have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, when that expectation is clarified, now relationships can be improved. Relationships can be strengthened. And if you have your Bible, you might want to turn to two passages with me. If not, I will read them to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 says this, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, employ you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. A critical person, a critical person presents unbiblical expectations and violates Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. But when the Bible clarifies expectations, then you will have humility and gentleness and patience, and tolerance, and a desire to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Philippians chapter 2 has a similar thought, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now, I want to translate verse 1 of Philippians 2 for you, because the idea of if kind of conjures up the thinking that it might be possible, or maybe. That's not the word if here in the Greek language. The Greek has three cases for the English word if. The first is, if it is a fact, but it's not. The second is, if it is a fact, and indeed it is. The third is, can be translated since or because. That's the third condition for if. So verse one says, therefore, since there is encouragement in Christ, since there is consolation of love, since there is fellowship with the Spirit, since there is affection and compassion, 
because of these four elements, because of the word of God has clarified expectations, now we can make the joy complete. How? Four things. We're going to be thinking alike. We're going to be at the same level of love. We're going to be united in spirit. And we're going to be intent on one purpose, which is glorifying God. However, if truthfulness becomes the measuring stick and all the characteristics that I presented to you of that, guess what happens in that relationship? Nothing. It continues to be fractured and damaged and frayed. So this is a visual of the difference between truthfulness and truth. Maybe sometimes we need to be mindful if someone says, well, I'm just going to be truthful with you. Well, that might raise a red flag in, in my mind. I would, have, I would rather have the person said, say to me, I want to share with you some truth from God's word. Now, both of our attention is focused on the Bible, not a person's expectations for me, even though they disguise it with the word truthfulness. Now, there is a Greek word in the scriptures that will help to understand if I'm using truthfulness or truth. There is a Greek word to help us. And the word is krino. K-R-I-N-O, crino. We get our English word discernment. Crino means having the ability to separate feelings so the facts can be clearly seen and acted upon. Crino is a word of evaluation. It's a word of judgment. It's a word of testing. And so what does the believer use for crino? Well, they use the Bible. The critic must use discernment because of the overwhelming power of feelings that may conceal the facts regarding the person or the incident. Relying upon the Bible to render judgment, balance truth and grace, and be loving is so desperately needed in relationships. So, the first pillar, if you please, in practicing criticism, the proper practice would be the element of truth, the pillar of truth. The second is the mark of voice. The mark of voice. Voice includes such things as pitch, characteristics, and volume of the voice. The way the words are delivered and the manner of speaking also make up part of the tone. The tone of your voice may say more than the actual words you use. The important feature of everyday speech is so powerful that it can actually propel you to successful heights or keep you stuck in a lowly position. Tone of voice is made up of several factors and functions in a variety of way. Now, someone is shouting to you, I love you, in a loud voice, may nullify the message. It might sound angry, unpleasant, insincere, and unattractive. Now, let's take a look at some scriptures about our voice. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 12, 14, a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his words, and the deeds of a man's hands will return to him. Proverbs 15, 26, evil plans are an abomination to the Lord, but pleasant words are pure. 1624, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. 1627, 
A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. And then 2920, do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And then 2511 says this, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Now, words convey tone. Tone reflects what is inside the human heart. If no good came, excuse me, if someone says, I am critical, we need to ask ourselves some questions. For example, was I using harsh words? Did the hearer hear harshness in my tone? What good should come from this conversation? In other words, what were my expectations? If no good came, how could I have changed my tone? Were my words pleasant, attractive? Were my words pure? Did my tone bring healing or did I deepen the wounds of the hearer? Did I remind the hearer of his or her past? Did I burn them? Did I think before I spoke? Did I just want to vent? Did I speak at the right time? In the right circumstances? Would my message have been received better if I had been more in tune with others rather than myself? And these are all very important questions that you can ask yourself when someone charges you or tells you you're being critical. Now, the variable here, beloved, is this thing called perception. Perception. You might answer all these questions in a positive way. Your words were pleasant, that you did not attack. You had the right time, so forth and so on. And the person still might say, you're being critical of me. That is their perception. Let me give you a fact of life if you have not discovered it already. There is very little that you can do about a person's perception of you. If you are in the truth, living the truth, speaking the truth, and someone still says that you are critical, you can't do anything about their perception. This is an issue they have with God, and it's being stirred up by the life of truth, the word of truth that you might be communicating. Proper use of criticism, the mark of attitude. The mark of attitude. Did you realize attitude is conveyed using language? Attitude can be observed in a person's nonverbal language as well as the tone, which we previously discussed. Everyone has an attitude, it is part of human nature. Attitude is a feeling you have, a disposition, a value, or a state of mind. In addition, it is how you view life and things as well as how you behave towards others. You can readily see how one's attitude can promote a critical spirit. Attitude can color what we say. It's important because it can color everything you do, say, and think. If you have a positive attitude, it is more likely that you will accomplish your goals and overcome setbacks. If you have a negative attitude, you may not achieve your desired goals. Criticism is rooted in self. Its focus is on what the other person should be or not be doing. It is myoptic. 
seeing only a person's failures. Criticism is predisposed in its attitude, again, largely because of its unrealistic, unexplained, or unstated expectations. Now, the first critical attitude recorded by the Holy Spirit in, in the scriptures is found in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And you know the story about Cain and Abel, God accepting Cain, uh, Abel's offering and rejecting Cain. I'm not going to read all those verses for you. But there are some things that we should note here. Cain's offering was rejected while his brother Abel's offering was accepted. I will not present arguments on how this might have occurred. For the sake of this point on attitude, Cain's offering was rejected. Cain had an expectation about how God should respond. When God did not respond like Cain wanted, Cain's countenance fell and he became angry. Now, countenance is the facial expression of a person that indicates mood, emotion, or character. You can look at somebody's face and take a look at them, whether they are sad, discouraged, defeated, joyous, happy. The face communicates tremendously. It also means bearing or expression that offers approval or sanction, the word countenance. We see once again a person's expectations are unmet and the ensuing sinful action. So what happened? Cain became angry. I liken his countenance falling like a pouting child. His lower lip was quivering, dragging the ground, eyes blazing, neck bulging, hands shaking, tingling sensation, irritable, halting movements, pacing back and forth. We cannot hide our critical attitude. If nobody else knows, God knows. And God confronts Cain with his critical attitude, and God will do that with us as his children. God points it out to Cain, and I love what God does here. God says, Cain, and I'm paraphrasing, this attitude you are sporting is unbecoming as one of my creatures. You need an attitude adjustment. And this was the first AA meeting ever recorded in human history. How does a critical person change their attitude? Well, God calmly tells Cain what to do. First, make the best choice. God tells Cain if he will do well. First, note that a critical person has a choice to do the right thing or the wrong thing. They are at a decision when their criticism is confronted with truth. Second, the Hebrew word for well means excellent. God wants Cain to choose the excellent thing to do. Instead of making decisions based on what he wants or expects, God asks Cain to make a superior choice, an excellent choice. What would that choice be? Examine why God rejected his offering and accepted his brother's offering. If Cain would do this, if he would perform a self-examination, God says his countenance would be lifted up, his focus would be upward, not inward or outward. Now, what made this important for Cain to do? Why should Cain do this? God tells him. God says that he needs this time out because sin is crouching at the door. The Hebrew word means to stretch out or to lie down. It might be pictured as a lion stretching himself out near a bush ready to spring 
on an unsuspecting gazelle. A critical person must master it. Sin is at the door and it wants to master you, the scripture says. It is our responsibility to master a critical attitude. The word for master in the Hebrew, and we've looked at this back in Judges with Gideon, means marshal. It means to rule, to reign or have dominion. It's the same word God tells Adam that he will need in his marital relationship. A critical attitude springs upon the hearer, but God says it can be avoided if the critical person will make the excellent choice. Critical attitude wants to rule. It wants to seize power that does not rightfully, rightfully belong to it. It seeks to usurp God's authority and sovereignty. Now, let's talk about the mark of timing. Let's see, did I go one too many slides? I guess I did. Okay, the mark of timing. The wisest man in the world spoke about timing in his book, Ecclesiastes. He writes that there is a time for everything under the sun. Isaiah 32, 6 says, For a fool speaks nonsense, and his heart inclines towards wickedness, to practice ungodliness, ungodliness and to speak error against the Lord. A critical person acts foolish. Ruled by his emotion, he speaks nonsense. He is inclined to wickedness, namely to develop a lifestyle that is void of godly characteristics which speak against the Lord's sovereign way. Why is it that people do not speak up when the time calls for it? They do not want to get involved? They believe if you just love the person, they will recognize the error of their way? They believe speaking up is judgmental and no one has the right to judge another's heart, save God. They claim the person is simply immature and it is a phase they are going through. They will grow out of it. How do we determine when is the right time to speak to someone? Here are some diagnostic questions that I propose for us. Have I prayed about the situation before going to them? Many times we are fueled up by our own emotions. And so we embark. It's like going to fight a fire and we have the wrong suppressant. You have specific suppressants, fire suppressants for specific types of fire. If you don't use the right one, it's just going to grow worse. Have I prayed about the situation before going? Now, caution here, beloved. You can say that you're praying about it and it's months down the road. You're using prayer at that point as an excuse. Have I searched my heart to see how I might be contributing to the situation? Communication over criticism is a two way street. What am I bringing to the table? What am I wanting to communicate? What are the things that I might need to anticipate so I can have a soft answer? Have I searched my heart to see how I might be contributing to the situation? Lord, search me and know me, Psalm 139. See if there be any wicked way in me. And then have I searched my heart to see if I have unrealistic, unfulfilled, unstated expecta expectations of the person. Well, criminally, by, by this time, you should be at this level. You should be doing this. You should not be doing that. Okay, now you have an expectation. It might be biblical, but you're approaching it in an unbiblical way. We're not using the word of God. And so in that diagram, the two people still have the conflict between them. Have I selected biblical words to use? 
The Holy Spirit is the most powerful person that God has given to you in order to communicate God's truth. The Holy Spirit uses biblical words. He does not use psychology. He does not use humanism. He does not use cultural relevance. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword discerning between the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So when you're dealing with criticism or a critical person and you have identified what the issue is, both have to use biblical words. And in order to do that, the Bible has to be central, right? What is my motivation for going at this time? What is my motivation for going at this time? The passing of time could be a benefit. Now, let me clarify that so you don't think I'm contradicting myself. There is a time to speak and a time to refrain from speaking. But we should never use the excuse, it's not the right time. That is a self-preservation excuse. We're trying to shield ourselves from either actual hurt or perceived hurt. The right time to speak the truth is always the right time. But I have to check my motivation for going at this time. Am I trying to prove a point? Am I trying to put that person in their place? What am, what's my motivation? My motivation should be restoration. And restoration is always an immediate number one agenda that needs to be strived for. And then what are my goals? What, what, what do I hope to accomplish here? And beloved, maybe you need to make a list of the goals. And then maybe you need to cross off all the ones that are personal and not biblical. Your goal has to be biblical. And again, I come back to there needs to be, if necessary, confession. There needs to be repentance. There needs to be restoration. And there needs to be a plan to rebuild. Second Timothy talks to us about the word of God as inspired, right? It's profitable for what? Teaching for reproving, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. The thing that lacks when there is criticism and it appears on the surface that things have been dealt with, the thing that is lacking is the last part of 2 Timothy chapter 3 about the Word of God, training in righteousness. How do we prevent this from happening again? That's what that word that phrase means. And then have I gathered all pertinent facts? Underline the word pertinent. Many times we have facts, but they are distilled. They are diluted because of our own personal feelings and emotions. What are the personal facts? Per pertinent facts, not personal facts, pertinent facts could be pictured like the difference between an x-ray and an MRI. Sometimes you need an MRI to give you a clearer understanding of the injury because many times x-rays don't reveal the extent of the injuries. And then what emotions am I wrestling with? How should the fruit of the Spirit replace my wrong emotions? I'll tell you what, criticism opens up the can of worms in our lives. I don't believe there's a person who's a masochist that says, oh, bring it on, criticize me. Oh, that feels so good. Hit me again, hit me again. No, it stirs up all sorts of emotions. For some, it brings back perhaps unresolved childhood memories 
of maybe a parent or a teacher or somebody in the youth group that kept finding fault and criticizing me. And if I haven't dealt with those, I'm carrying those around in the backpack. How should the fruit of the Spirit replace my wrong emotions or sinful emotions? Am I willing to be patient with all men, teaching some that they might come to the knowledge of the truth? Patience is one of the elements of the fruit of the Spirit. We have been given patience because we have the fruit of the Spirit if we are a believer. And so Scripture tells us to be patient with all men, teaching some, notice it doesn't say all, teaching some that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. My patience can give me an opportunity to teach. Now, what happens after that will be based on the person receiving the knowledge of the truth and responding to it. And then finally, have I considered the hearer's recent pattern of living? The person's recent pattern of living. That is not spelled right. It's not patter, pattern. In other words, Boy, did I not spell check this. Are there issues in their life at this time, such as overtime, new baby, upside down in a mortgage or car payments, underemployed, not employed, health issues, etc.? In other words, walk a mile in their moccasins. What are what is going on in their life? This can help me be patient. Now It doesn't necessarily mean that the Spirit of God will not give us discernment into this person's pattern of living. We can always, all of us, improve our pattern of living, right? If we would return to one-tenth of one percent of understanding the principle of stewardship of time. If you, if we fritter away time, if we squander it, if we invest it in wrong activities and wrong events, things that do not build up, we'll never get that time back. You can't wake up in the morning and say, oh boy, did I blow blow it yesterday? And I watched a a marathon uh, uh, TV session of, of whatever. Okay, I I repent. I apologize. You're not going to get that time back. It's lost. It's lost. And sometimes people who are critical might have things going on in their life. But prayerful discernment might also reveal, uh, might reveal how to help that person with the management of their time or their finances or whatever it might be. And then should I call or email first asking to see them or do I just pop in? I believe if you're dealing with a critical person, you should not just pop in. I believe that will put that person on a defensive. Uh, I would encourage you to call or email and ask to meet with them. I would not try to handle things by email. You cannot read the tone. You cannot, all you see is words on a page and they can be misunderstood. Calling might be better, but it's not face to face. And I believe Matthew 18 commands us to go face to face, not use email or texting or make a phone call. And of course you might read retort to me they didn't have phones back then and you would be absolutely correct next week we're going to talk about biblical response to criticism or how to respond to the critical person so with that in mind we'll ask if there are any thoughts from great readers well we had a small class tonight my goodness Anybody have a thought? 